Hey, everybody. Uh, my name's Dustin. Like I was just saying, uh, I'm a member of the Python Packaging Authority. I'm also the director of uh, PromptWorks, which is a software consultancy here in Austin, Texas. I'm an organizer of uh, the PyTexas conference, if anyone's been to PyTexas. Uh, it's going to happen again this year. Dates are going to be announced shortly. Uh, I'm also a member of the Python Packaging Working Group, the Python Packaging Authority, like I said. And I'm also a maintainer of uh, PyPI, the Python Package Index. And I, I kind of had a hard time coming up with the, the title of this talk. And it's not just because that naming things are hard, uh, even though naming things are hard. The reason I had a hard time coming up with the title of this talk is because I knew that I wanted to talk about Python packaging. But a lot of people have already given talks about Python packaging. There was just a talk about Python packaging right before me. Um, so, so many people, in fact, have given talks that every time I came up with the title for this talk, it kind of seemed like someone had already done it. So at first I thought, you know, what, what is the core of Python packaging? I will call my talk Python packaging, getting the code you wrote to the people that you wanted using the same language that you wrote it in. This talk's already been done. And that title's pretty long, so maybe I should do something a little more uh, clickbaity, like Python packaging in just five easy steps. This has been done. I thought maybe I could one-up his talk. I could do Python packaging in just maybe four easy steps. He did that as well. So maybe I should be encouraging about Python packaging. Python packaging, it's relatively painless now. Go ahead and use it. This has been done. But relatively painless is still kind of painful, so maybe I should try to instill confidence that Python packaging is improving. So I'll call it Python packaging. We're still trying to make this better. This has been done. All right, maybe I should take a stronger approach. Python packaging, let's just throw it all away and start over from scratch. This talk's been given. Maybe the problem is that Python packaging has changed too much. So I'll say, Python packaging, let me just get you up to speed with everything that's changed since the last time this talk's been given. Then I figured, maybe not everyone actually cares about everything in packaging. I'll give a talk, Python packaging, there's a lot of stuff here, you might not need all of it. This talk's been given. So maybe I should keep it simple. Python packaging, in the simplest terms possible for anyone that cares. No, this talk has been given as well. All right, maybe even simpler. Uh, Python packaging, so easy a caveman could do it. This talk exists. All right, I'm really starting to, to run out of options at this point. So maybe I should try to stick to something a little closer to, to my personal experience. So how about, hello, I'm a PyPI maintainer. At the very least, I should be able to tell you how to use PyPI, right? No, this talk already exists as well. All right, one last stitch effort. Uh, I'll do Python packaging, but I'll make it uh, Indiana Jones themed, and I'll do it in French. <laughs> There's no way this has been done before, right? No. <laughs> Okay, so it really seems like everything that could have been said about Python packaging has already been said. So uh, let's just wrap this up. I'll give you links to those talks. You can go watch them on YouTube. <laughs> the end. No. So in the end, I picked this title, Inside the Cheese Shop, How Python Packaging Works, which is a really awful title for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's got an obscure reference to something that makes no sense. Why am I talking about a cheese shop? I don't actually know anything about cheese. The second is, Python packaging is an incredibly broad and complex subject. Trying to explain how it works is perhaps like kind of a lost cause or a fool's errand. And third, uh, historically, I'm making the assumption that Python packaging actually works, which has historically been the biggest complaint about the topic. But here's the thing. I actually think that Python packaging works pretty great. And we've actually really just gotten used to how good we have it now. So I really, truly do want to do some uh, packaging archaeology with you all. And I want to talk about the evolution of packaging through the years to provide some context for why things are the way they are now and about how at each step we had a new problem to solve and a new solution for that problem, which began a new problem, on and on. So let's go back in time. Back in time when Python was brand new, this is Guido's release message for the very first uh, release of Python. Back into a time when uh, everything was new and, and everything that we're used to today did, just didn't exist at all. Back to a time when there was just Python. So pretty much as soon as there was Python, there was something written in Python. And, and let's pretend you're the author of this totally awesome library. Nice job. Um, but really at the moment, this code is only useful to you, right? So our first problem is, how do you get this code to users? And this is really the fundamental problem of, of packaging in general. How do you get code to users? 
Maybe you talk to your friends and you say, hey, I have this totally awesome library, uh, and then you have to get it to them. So maybe you could email to someone every time you found a new person at a conference or something that wanted to use it, but obviously that would get pretty quickly become painful. Maybe you could put it up on your website somewhere with a link to download it. And this would be nice because you could add some like documentation, but how will people like find it if they want it? Python was first released in 1991. Google wouldn't be around for another six years. So this leads us to a new problem. How do I find Python code? So what we need is a place where people can go to find interesting Python code, some sort of like index for Python packages. I think that we will call it uh, the vaults of Parnassus. So this is the vaults of Parnassus. This is the very first index for Python software. And it's literally an index. It just linked to something on someone else's website. And I hesitate to use the word package here because at this point what a package is in terms of Python is, not, is really loosely defined. So the end result is just whatever people felt like putting on their website, there was no standard or enforcement of quality or quality level or anything like that, and that leads to a new problem. At the time, every project came with its own special little way to build it. Maybe there was a Python script, maybe there was a make file, maybe it was just like instructions and a text file, and this is really painful for users to have to say to everything they want to install, how do I build this? So the solution at the 1998 International Python Conference, which would become PyCon, uh, a little project got started called DistUtils for distribution utilities. And this was included in the standard library in Python 1.6 in 2000. And this gave us kind of a familiar incantation, Python setup.py, blah, 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 which is probably really familiar to folks. And I think some people have actually run this without really thinking about what is going on here. It's just a Python script, right? Uh, with a little magic, thanks to the standard library. And the idea was, why bother to write like a new domain-specific language or add a new config file when you already have like the full power of Python at your disposal? So we'll just write more Python, and we'll see why that becomes a problem in a second. So it's really originally designed to just be a build tool to replace all those make files and things, and the goal was to make something in a consistent way that could then be installed. DistUtils also gave us another solution. Uh, it gave us a way to package up source code for sharing, uh, and this is a source distribution. It's a compressed archive like a zip or a, a tarball or et cetera. And this is also called uh, an sdist, or I like to say it like a snake, stist. Um, and this command might be a little more familiar, Python set up to py sdist. Um, but it's quickly pretty obvious that sometimes source distributions weren't gonna cut it. So sometimes source distributions are fine if you have pure Python, but sometimes you have so much to do during the build step, like possibly compiling C or maybe even Fortran code, that it becomes costly to do this every time you want to install some dependency. And it feels really wasteful if you're doing it over and over again for the same architecture in different places. So the solution to this is something called built distributions. Instead of a source that's compiled, you take a distribution that's been pre-built for your architecture, and you just sort of literally copy and paste. You drop it in place, and there's no build step necessary. This is also called a BDIS for built distribution. And you'd build it like this. So Python set up to PyBDIS. There's other ways to sort of do the same thing with Wheel. Um, so distribution is pretty great. And having a consistent way to just build things was immensely helpful. But it punted on solving two really key problems. First problem was, how can I do packaging? And this is just the generic idea of packaging. By this I mean, how do I get the user to the state right before they run the build command? How do I get everything they need in place before they can build? Um, but it's not put together yet. So the original authors of DistUtils and Python, they saw this as a solved problem. In their minds, all the platforms that they wanted to put Python on already had system level package managers. I'm talking about Linux package managers like RPM or something like that. They couldn't imagine developers would ever want to do development on platforms that didn't have a package manager. Well, guess what? Turns out developers love developing on platforms that don't have official package managers like macOS or Windows. And so there's another problem with the solution. Maybe my platform doesn't even have packaging. Or maybe your platform does have a package manager, but the packages in a package manager usually lag behind releases because they need to be built for that particular distribution. So once the author has published the code in some way, the, the package platform maintainers need to take that package, build it up, and put it for the specific platform, put it in that specific index for that platform. And as a user, you want that fresh release right now. You don't want to have to wait for it. So the solution was to create a package index that is just for Python, and we call this the Python package index. This is what it looked like in October of 2002. 
PyPI gave us an official, consistent, and centralized place to put Python software. And I say put because it still is just linking to externally hosted files, but it has a little more structure. And like I said, we call this PyPI, you can say it with me, PyPI, not PyPy, because that's something totally else. Like I said, naming things is really hard. So PyPI is also sometimes called the cheese shop, and the cheese shop is a reference to this uh, Monty Python skit, where a man goes in a cheese shop which has no cheese for sale, and the joke is that when PyPI was first created, there was nothing in it. So it's not even really appropriate to call it that anymore, given the hundreds of thousands of packages it has. The other problem that the distutils authors punted on was being able to specify dependencies. There was no way to say that a given package depended on some other package being installed as well. And this makes sense. They didn't have a centralized index to point to, so they didn't have a way to do this. But now that we have a package index, it's possible to not only point to some version of a package somewhere, but it's also possible to distribute something that does more than distutils, which again was the standard in the standard library and came with your Python installation. So the solution to this problem is setup tools. Setup tools essentially monkey patch distutils in the standard library. And there's some advantages here. It's quicker to ship code to users. They don't have to upgrade their entire Python distribution to get new distribution utilities. And there are some disadvantages as well, though, unfortunately. Monkey patching is never really a great idea, especially monkey patching things in the standard library. But once we had setup tools, all sorts of other things could come along with it. So now that we can specify uh, dependencies easily, how can we make them easy to, easier to install? One of the problems users are having, installing is just too hard. The solution to this was a tool called Easy Install. And this did, in theory, make it easier for users to install various projects. And when paired with setup tools, this would allow users to install dependencies for a project directly from PyPI. And it, it introduced a new type of build distribution because the existing ones weren't cutting it. This is called the egg distribution. There are other types of eggs too, but the built distribution type is the important egg that everyone knows. And an egg is just a zip file with some metadata. It could contain Python code as well. The name comes from Python. Pythons lay eggs. But easy install gave us a whole new set of problems. First of all, easy install was really good at installing. It was so easy, it couldn't uninstall packages. It couldn't tell you what you had installed on your system. And it also mucked around with uh, sys.path, which is generally not a great idea. So the solution was a new tool called PyInstall. And you probably have never heard of PyInstall. And this is because pretty much as soon as PyInstall was created, uh, there was a new problem. The name PyInstall is too long. And typing PyInstall install seems redundant. Like I said, naming things is hard. So the solution was to rename PyInstall to pip. And this happens almost immediately. And the name pip isn't an obscure reference. It stands for pip installs packages. So we swapped redundancy for a recursive backronym, and while easy install is still around, pip soon becomes the preferred installer. Pip did a kind of funny thing. Pip ignores eggs entirely, and it only installed from source distributions. It saw all the problems that easy install was having with eggs, and it said, we want nothing to do with that. So at this point, people are using pip to install dependencies for applications. Uh, not for installing dependencies for other packages. Essentially, for an application, there is no top-level project to install. So if we want to specify dependencies of an application, what do we do? The solution is pip introduced a file called requirements.txt, and this includes pinning specific versions of dependencies for, at, to, at the top level or across your application. And this gives us the familiar pip install-r requirements.txt. This allows for semi-reproducible environments. So now everyone's happily pip installing. We have new, everyone's happily pip installing. Things are going great, but we have a new problem. The problem is installing from PyPI is kind of slow. So remember, at this point, PyPI is still an index. So when pip has to install something, it has to go crawl PyPI and then go to a bunch of other domains. And those other domains might not be performant. The files might not even be there anymore. And for that matter, um, PyPI might not be performant either. So one of the problems here is that this requires users to trust all these third-party domains where packages were hosted. As a package maintainer, I don't, I don't want to have to trust a, like a whole plethora of third-party domains. What happens when I forget to re-register my domain and my package is, is hosted on that, on that domain? An attacker could go and register it, put malicious code in its place, my users could go and install it, no problem. So the users are so used to pip installing things that 
they, and connecting to random domains all over the place that they'll never actually even notice that this, this is happening. So the solution to this problem is that PyPI decides PyPI will begin hosting releases. This was specified in PEP 438. And now PyPI literally hosts distributions. The, all the files are on PyPI itself, no more third-party domains. Around this time, we start to notice kind of a, a new problem. Scientific Python is now a thing. So somehow, we kind of didn't see this coming. And using Python for scientific computing or data science brings along this whole new set of challenges that, that disk details and things uh, weren't uh, expecting. One sub-problem here is that disk details is just simply not up to the task. The original authors and contributors to the tools that you know and love today, they spent a lot of time trying to make disk details work uh, for things that it was never actually designed to handle, like compiling extensions that needed Fortran compiled libraries. Another problem is build environments. The main problem here was this utils has a total lack of a way to define a build environment, everything that needs to be in place before you can build, build a project. Um, Disutils and setup.py make a lot of assumptions about what user needs to build and install package. They basically are just only thinking, yes, you need Python. That's, that should be good enough. Maybe GCC. Um, and disutils doesn't provide a good framework for, for modifying these assumptions either. If you suddenly decide you need to specify build environment, it doesn't give you a way to do it. Another problem is scientific Python, you really, I need pre-built binaries. It's really painful to compile things from source. And again, at this point, we had gotten rid of eggs, and uh, you know, so there was no way to distribute um, um, built distributions. So if you can nail down an ABI, it makes far more sense to build it once, distribute the binary. Um, but yeah, like I said, got rid of eggs, no binary distributions either. The last problem is, uh, or the second last problem, maybe you need more than Python. Maybe you need uh, R, LLVM, HDF5, MKL. These are fundamentally unmanageable by any tool that is just focused on Python, right? These are all things outside of the Python ecosystem, but inside the scientific computing ecosystem. The last problem is maybe, maybe you don't even have Python, right? Maybe Python is not installed on your system. So all of these things are kind of outside the scope of the Python Packaging Authority and everyone that had been working on these projects up until this point, which kind of just assume either that you have Python or you really just want to do Python and maybe some C. The solution to this problem is Anaconda and Conda. Anaconda is, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, a distribution of uh, over 1,000 open source software packages. Conda is a Python agnostic packaging tool installer. You can install Python things with it. You can install non-Python things with it. Installing Anaconda gives you both Python and non-Python tools that you need all in one shot, and it satisfies a lot of these use cases, including uh, providing a way to ship binary distributions. Now we have a new problem. We need built distributions, again. Back in the regular Python ecosystem, we're getting a little jealous of all these binary distributions that the scientific uh, Python community is, is shipping. So it turns out uh, we need these, and it's still a problem, um, but we don't want eggs. Eggs are still really poorly defined, and file name conventions are not enough to capture all of the possible platforms that an egg could be built for. Uh, and they've been given a really bad rap as well. So the solution is the wheel distribution. And this is just another dis built distribution, like eggs, um, but it's also, uh, just a zip file, but most importantly, it has a specification. Um, there's PEP, PEP 427 that specifies the, the wheel package format, and it has also had the ability to learn from all of the mistakes easy install and egg distribution was able to make. It's, the name came from a wheel of cheese. You put wheels in a cheese shop. I really like to think that the authors of the spec really got the name right, actually, because in addition, nobody can actually say they're going to reinvent the wheel. So at this point, a lot of people are, depending on PyPI, we start to become a little more focused on making sure that it's secure. And we have a problem. PyPI is starting to show its age. So this is uh, PyPI in 2007, when it's about four years old. And here it is about a month and a half ago. Put these images side by side. This is 10 years in between these two images. It's kind of like one of those uh, spot the difference games, right? So it's not really fair to visually compare PyPI in 2007 with PyPI in 2018. One thing that you uh, might not see from this graph is that the number of packages went from less than 3,000 to more than 130,000. In that time, PyPI went from a place to get Python packages to the place to get Python packages, which included lots of issues with PyPI being down or having outages. 
And there were a lot of things that had to happen behind the scenes so that PyPI could continue to work. Um, the other thing is that by its very nature, PyPI predates almost all the packages that exist on it, including all the web frameworks, testing frameworks that you're familiar with. So it's 15 years old. Uh, it has pretty much no tests, doesn't use a modern web framework. Um, to run it locally in development, you have to go and like comment out huge chunks of it. So what should we do? Solution, maybe we should rewrite PyPI from scratch. So normally if you ask me if a full stack rewrite of a core piece of infrastructure depended on by hundreds of thousands of users would ever succeed, I would tell you no. Uh, but I don't know if anyone noticed, but this happened. We got a new PyPI. This is also called warehouse, warehouse as in a place to put packages. This is a project that started more or less in 2011 and had a number of goals, including uh, HTTPS everywhere, using current best practices and modern web framework and tests. And it be officially became PyPI in April. And I have to say, this was a really tremendous undertaking, and it would, uh, absolutely, it would have absolutely not been possible to have been completed in any reasonable amount of time without support from um, Mozilla Software Foundation. All right, so that's it, right? We launched PyPI, we solved all the problems, good job. No. We still have current problems. But this is the very nature of software, right? Once we build the new shiny thing, we start to realize what it can do or what the need actually is. So one problem we have is packaging is still kind of hard, especially if you're new to it all. There are a lot of different tools and a lot of things you've never heard of maybe until today. The solution to this problem is the Python packaging guide. Um, this is a really carefully crafted and well-maintained guide to Python packaging and she'll walk you through a lot of the steps for, for building and distributing Python code. Another solution is a sample project. This is a skeleton project for your Python package. It represents best practices for the simplest possible Python package. Another solution is just general care and maintenance. In general, I think uh, these more modern projects are more well specified, and they are also easier to maintain. And in addition, there's a serious focus on making these accessible to newcomers. In fact, I would say that we actually have a new problem now. Uh, packaging is kind of maybe a little too easy. I could have called this talk Python packaging so easy a spammer could do it. Uh, having packaging be hard has actually had some unintended benefits, namely that folks who aren't truly invested in uh, the community can't figure out how to use it. And unfortunately, this also excludes a lot of people that don't have malicious intent. So while lowering that barrier is a priority, it does um, it produce some new problems like spam on PyPI, typo squatting, et cetera. And there's another uh, problem that's kind of common these days. One problem is re reproducible environments. So requirements.txt was a great step towards creating a reproducible environment. We can use it to specify exactly the versions and the hashes of any dependency for pip to install. However, creating and maintaining this file can be really challenging. And we have maybe sometimes multiple requirements files for deploying, testing, documentation, et cetera. So the solution to this is a, a new file called pip file, dot, pip file and pip file dot log. This is a single human editable file and a single generated file with fully deterministic dependencies, which can be shared across multiple dependency installing tools. So this, if you're coming from another community, this might feel like gemfile.lock or yarn.lock, et cetera. Another problem that we're working actively on right now is that because setup.py is just a Python script, you can put arbitrary code in setup.py. And so there's no way to truly predict what dependencies a package will have without actually going and running it. And I see questions about this so often that um, I actually wrote a blog post, why PyPI doesn't know your project dependencies. And the answer is you can do anything you want in a setup.py file. And this makes it really hard to reason about source distributions. And there's an additional problem with uh, setup.py as well. There's this distutils setup tools dance. Extending and maintaining them is really difficult. Distutils because it's in the standard library and setup tools because it's old and it's a big ball of mud. Um, so while there do exist various solutions to the above problems, they're really hard to implement and they're even harder to maintain. And also it's very difficult to use anything else. Um, they are essentially the de facto standard interface for building Python projects. And changing it kind of becomes this chicken and egg problem. The solution to this problem is PEP 5.17 and 5.18. PEP 5.17 uh, provides a way to specify a build system independent format for source trees. And 5.18 is able, is the abil adds the ability to specify build system requirements for Python projects. So this produces a file, uh, this allows us to use a file called pyproject.toml, which is a step away from distutils, setup tools entirely, 
It allows users to specify their own build requirements for their project, uh, which can then be installed prior to building. And this, they, these requirements could be setup tools, or they could be something else entirely. If you just saw the talk before, this John Christoph's talk, uh, it could be something like scikit build. All right, that sounds like a lot of problems, you might say. Uh, and also consider that unlike uh, a lot of other packaging environments, uh, with only a few small exceptions, Python packaging is entirely volunteer driven. So maybe you would like to help. Both PyPI and PIP have good first issues label in their trackers. So if you wanted to become a contributor today, you can do it. And there's a lot of folks that are uh, ready and able to help mentor you through that process. I told you how to help us, but um, here's how we could help you also. If you're having problems, you can do the following, and sort of in the order from how quickly you need your problem solved, from quick to might take a while. So like I said, the Python packaging guide is a really invaluable tool. There are issue trackers for each of the individual tools you might encounter in the ecosystem. Their maintainers are generally pretty responsive. There's a hashtag PyPA uh, free node channel that's open to anyone to chat about problems or issues with Python tools. Uh, and there's also a general purpose GitHub repository um, the packaging problems repository where you can file an issue about uh, sort of large, bigger problems with the ecosystem, try to drive changes forwards. Um, you can also talk to me. I'm really happy to help. I'm DI on GitHub, DI codes on Twitter, and you can email me, di at python.org, and I love talking to users. So to summarize real quick, um, packaging isn't bad. Uh, there are always gonna be problems that need to be solved here. We've made really gradual changes over a period of time, and the change, each change has been a response to sort of an evolving need. Comparatively, we used to have it really bad, and we might have actually just forgotten or just not known how hard it used to be. So the next time that you are frustrated with Python packaging, imagine a world with no pip, no PyPI, no conda, and consider making a pull request. Thanks. Thank you, Dustin. Um, one minute for maybe one short question. Uh, is the uh, next speaker here in the room? I'll also be outside in the hallway if you want to chat with me. Uh, so that we c I, I would like to see the next speaker uh, come up so that uh, setup can start. OK, saw you. All right. Uh, is there one question? There you are. Yeah. Anthony, yeah. go on. Hi, I'm Anthony Skopat. So um, if I was an enterprising developer and I wanted to remove and replace package resources from the earth, how would one go about doing that? Uh, I think you, you would be able to join a, a small group of people that have the same, uh, same plan. I think, I think that's something within, at least within Setup Tools, um, th there is sort of a, a plan to, to, to do that work now. So I could put you in touch with folks that, that are interested in doing that. That would be great. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Uh, like I said, I'll be out in the hallway. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Thanks very much.